Now, I know I was asked about Lisvenga quite a bit before it released, since it visually looks like an action RPG, so I made sure to request a press key for it. Though in reality, and this is part of the advertising, is that it's more of a puzzle game with action mechanics, which is fine for me, but might impact your interest personally. And overall, it fulfills that role fairly competently though, with a pinch of world building, an interesting mix of visual themes and combat methods, though it does come with some caveats that might make or break the game for you. Though the first one I have to get out of the way is performance, mainly since I want to keep it separate from the rest of the review, because it is very conditional. Simply put, if you're running an AMD card like I am, I would wait until we see a few patches from them, hopefully one with a fix in it. This is because while it can run stable for stretches of time, there is something about the skill menu that is consistently causing crashes on AMD cards, at least in the 6000 and 7000 series. While working my way through the title, it hard crashed my video drivers at least 10 times. It took OBS with it three of those times, and I had to reboot after each one or any 3D rendering would be a stuttering mess. And of the hundreds of games I've ran on this system, this is the only one with that issue. And judging by the forums, it is only AMD systems that encounter this. That out of the way though, I want to treat the rest of the game fairly, so I took a day off after beating the game and writing this, to get that frustration out of my system so it doesn't influence this. And my ultimate opinion of the game as a whole is that it is just, well, okay. Definitely not game of the year, but has some cool concepts, a lot of fun parts, but a few bits of jank that kept it from really keeping me pulled in for more than an hour or two at a time, even in spite of the crashes. The world itself is fairly compelling, especially for a puzzle game, with fairly Aztec themes to the artwork that makes up the cutscenes at least, though a world lore that I couldn't quite trace to any folklore I know of, even though it feels like it might be based off of something which either means they nailed the atmosphere and theme, or they were introducing me to folklore that I am just unaware of. The simple, minimal spoiler version is that a group of entities known as the Raxus invaded the ancient cities, resulting in the queen performing a rite of ascension to godhood to protect her people by freezing the cities in time, and in turn, the Raxus as well, letting those who were outside the city escape and thrive. To protect those people, a line of people known as Lisfanga were born, generation after generation, for hundreds of years, until us. Where we're not a single Lisfanga, but rather twins. A brother attuned to magic, and a sister attuned to combat. The brother, though, mysteriously disappears, and not long after the seals of time break in the cities. We go to investigate, and then the game's arc begins. Unfolding the lore of the world both through stories from golems, interesting discoveries in the world, and conversations with a few entities that can speak coherently in the major cities we explore. Though, any more details than that would fall into spoiler territory, but let's just say, most of the story is fine, though there is one character that behaves irrationally, even within the scope of their character. And that pulled me out of it a bit, but it was actually necessary for the plot to continue how it was going. Though, talking about the story, that does introduce us to our first bit of jank. And while you can skip some of the dialogue, it is weirdly inconsistent, since some lines can be skipped if you've already finished reading it personally, while others cannot. It's extremely inconsistent, and sometimes you'll have to wait seconds to skip one, while others will just go right through. I'd weirdly feel less odd about it if it was like the cutscenes and just unskippable, period. Though personally, I'd prefer it if everything was skippable, since it makes it more accessible for speedruns, and this game would be a perfect fit for that due to how it functions mechanically. This is because the game's mechanics surround time manipulation itself, and it also has an optional inbuilt time goal for every battle, so it would make sense. Now, this optional time goal is mostly tied to achievements and is based on the sum of all your loops combined. But it also is not something to worry about if you just want to beat the game and experience the story, since, like I said, it is optional. The actual hard time limit on the levels is based on the number of clones you can use, and the type of rift that is formed on the map, 
with most being a standard amount of time, a few having shortened timers due to being unstable, and even less having extended timers. Though I didn't track how many of the last ones there are, since they don't start spawning until way later in the game, well past the time when you actually get the ability to extend the rifts yourself. That said, the actual puzzle aspect and some of the oddities of combat might get to some players, though mostly my only issue is that there were occasional glitches that made the game break its own rules, even if it was just random randomly and only rarely. The two main culprits being an exploding enemy called Bombats, which would sometimes get knocked in a random direction before exploding rather than the expected one, or even sometimes just glitching out and hanging in spot never exploding. The other being the game sometimes breaking the rule of enemies killed on a previous loop ignoring you. Basically they would ignore you unless they're interacted with. Though sometimes, enemies would randomly come out of this in spite of having the skull icon even if I intentionally walked as far away from them as possible. But when everything worked properly, it was an enjoyable experience, with new features added up until nearly the end of the game itself, ranging from the earliest introductions of things like using your clone to strike the back of a shielded enemy, or killing a chained together enemy simultaneously with your clone all the way to the end game mechanics such as an Ikaruga style color system for damaging enemies, and even enemies that can only be killed with one of your three specific weapons. For the most part, these features, along with the dozen or so others, would be present on some level from their point of introduction up to and through even the post game challenges. That said, a couple did get the temporary treatment, or were things I didn't really engage with since they kind of blended into the chaos for me, such as the exploding clones that come at about the halfway point. And to a lesser extent, the Ikaruga color system I mentioned before, which while it lasted a while, seemed forgotten after a certain point. This color system also flips on how it works at one point, going from toggle per round deals in most combats to one where you need to stand in a colored field to get attuned to it for a boss fight, which felt somewhat weird but was easy enough to adapt to. Though, speaking of boss fights, I weirdly found them significantly easier but also oddly enough way more engaging than the regular fights while exploring a level. This is probably because the boss fights didn't have any of the inconsistencies I mentioned in the normal levels, but also because they existed as multi-stage experiences where you got to use the mechanics you learned to deal with an imposing foe rather than basically beating up zerglings in a certain order. They also felt much more QA tested and clean, which is something I appreciate a lot in a puzzle game, since reliability and repeatability are extremely important in them, especially when it's time. I think the only boss encounter I had any qualms about was actually the final boss, which I'll skip putting on screen since it is a moderate spoiler, but I had the issue a lot of action RPGs run into, and that is red attack markers on a red background leading to it being awkward to actually do your appropriate dodges. It was doable, mostly because the boss had a bit of a pattern to them that you could follow, but it can still be frustrating your first few loops into the proper aggro stage of the fight. I have noticed a number of players also having issues with it as well, since one of its stages is something no other battle had done before and that is a survival stage instead of going purely offensive. Similarly, there was only one normal battle which felt explicitly bad, and that was due to the verticality of it, keeping you from being able to scout it like most of the other levels. It basically had three floors of enemies, but no way to toggle up and down through the floors to scout them for planning out your attack. So you either power through like I did and just rough it out your first try, or you intentionally go in and fail just to get the information you need. The only other level that had a similar blind fight to it involved two nearly identical maps and similarly themed enemies, so it didn't feel as annoying as this more disjointed three floor system. Now, the reason I pick on those two encounters in particular is that most of your challenges or difficulties elsewhere can be solved by changing up your character's skill or rune loadout, which can greatly influence how you solve a battle with my personal favorite being the skill that lets me choose where I start my next loop, which let me position future selves on top of key door triggers, or even focusing on specific chained enemies so I could pop them much quicker. And the reality is the skills are really diverse, from a teleport skill that lets you teleport back to where you were previously, dashes, various types of attacks and knockbacks, and other fun utilities. The selection is actually really fun, and you are unlocking them up to the end of the story. The same goes for a smaller selection of ultimate powers that can completely change the dynamic of battles, as well as runes which are just passive modifiers for the entirety of a battle. 
and have similar mixes of utility, defense, offense, as the normal skills. Now, you can tell by the unlock patterns of these, though, that you're meant to beat the story and then do the challenge battles, basically going back through and hitting the time goals, as well as interacting with an NPC that lets you refight previous battles, but with additional conditions and modified enemy layouts for achievements and a bit more story. The only real qualm I have with the skills, and this is oddly enough wouldn't have been an issue without the crashing, is that when you get a new skill, rune, or ultimate, the game usually swaps you to the new one immediately, meaning I'd need to hit the menu to swap back and risk the about 10% chance of the game hard crashing my video drivers. But it is something that irks me in other games without this issue, so I figured it's worth bringing up regardless. As far as collecting discoverables, skills from chests, increasing the number of loops, and getting new character costumes, these are gotten just by exploring the maps outside of battle areas. Most of these are fairly easy to spot with bright glowing chests for the loop shards, skins, and abilities, each with their own distinct color of yellow, green, and blue respectively. Though the first collectible you will find probably is the orb, which you really won't see a use for until quite a bit later in the game, and that is for purchasing outfits from an NPC to finish your collection. This resulted in them feeling a, like a bit of a waste of time for me when I finally figured out what they were for, since I was somewhat hoping they were for weapon or skill upgrades with some functional purpose, and it felt like a bit of a letdown. Though for people who like cosmetics and going for 100% collectibles in games, they're a fine addition. Even just casually playing through, I ended up finding most of them anyway, with only a couple being really far off the beaten path. Overall though, I find the game to be a fun experience. I love the artwork and the cutscenes, the music is good for the niche it's in, and the story is, well, fine. Especially for a puzzle combat game. If you're running a team green car, you should be good to go if it sounds like a fun 8-10 to 10 hour experience to you. If you're running a team red card, you might want to wait a bit for some patches though, unless you can deal with the crashes. And sadly, I have not heard any reports about how it performs on Intel cards, so you're kind of a gamble there as well. But either way, I give this a conditional thumbs up for sure, especially if they patch out the bugs. And if you want to watch these reviews and guides ad-free, they're all uploaded to Patreon as well, and become publicly viewable a week after release for everyone, even for free followers.